Externalities are one reason a government may want to intervene to correct a market failure. In the last lecture, we saw how governments use regulation and taxation to address these externalities. But we haven't talked about many of the other ways a government can intervene in the market by directly providing goods and services like roads and bridges, national defense, or public education. The argument for these types of interventions is another form of market failure, the problem of public goods. Public goods are goods that are non-rival and non-excludable. Goods are non-rival if more than one person can consume the same unit of good at the same time. If I consume the good, you can consume it too. Goods are non-excludable if the supplier can't prevent people from consuming the good without paying for it. Consider an extreme example, an ice cream cone versus a missile. An ice cream cone is clearly not non-rival. If I eat an ice cream cone, you can't eat that same ice cream cone. But a missile is non-rival. If I'm protected by a missile, that doesn't in any way lower the protection you receive from the same missile. And an ice cream clone is clearly not non-excludable. I don't have to give you my ice cream, and I certainly won't if you refuse to pay for it. But a missile is non-excludable. Once a government is protecting some area with a missile, it can't just tell some people in the area they're not covered. Goods like ice cream cones or cars or houses, which are rival and excludable, are called private goods. Goods like missiles or street lighting or fireworks, which are non-rival and non-excludable, are called public goods. Now, many goods might seem to be partway between private and public goods. For example, a pay-per-view movie on TV is non-rival, since my ordering and watching the movie doesn't in any way prevent you from ordering and watching the same movie at the same time. But it is excludable, since neither of us can watch the movie on our TVs unless we pay for it. Goods like pay-per-view movies, computer software, or private parks are non-rival and excludable and are referred to as club goods. And a good like wild fish is non-excludable since it's not possible to keep people from catching fish. But it is rival since the same fish cannot be caught and eaten more than once. Goods like wild fish or timber or a public basketball court that are non-excludable but rival are referred to as common goods. So why do we care about the difference between private goods and public goods? Because the market is only able to efficiently provide private goods. There's a market failure in the provision of public goods, and the private market will underprovide these goods. The logic is the same as it was for a positive externality. When you provide a public good, lots of people benefit, but you don't see that benefit, even though you're the one providing the good. So how do we determine how much of a public good should be produced? Suppose you're producing a public good. You're putting on a fireworks show in your neighborhood for Independence Day. The marginal cost to you of firing off one more firework is the $10 that next firework will cost you. And let's say the marginal benefit to you of firing off that fireworks is $5. It'd be fun for you to shoot the next firework, but it's not worth the $10 marginal cost. So you don't shoot off another firework. But suppose you have 10 neighbors watching the show and each of them values that next firework at a dollar. In total, the next firework would bring benefits of $15 to you and your 10 neighbors. The benefit to society or the social marginal benefit is $15. And the marginal cost is only $10. So from society's standpoint, you should buy the extra firework. That is, the benefit of everyone seeing the firework is greater than the cost of that firework. But since your benefit is less than your cost of the next firework, you don't buy it. This is a classic example of a market failure. Your private decision has not produced the highest level of social welfare. Now you might say there's a simple solution. Just charge your neighbors for the fireworks. If you collect $1 from each one, you'll have $10 from your neighbors, which combined with your $5 private benefit is enough to buy the next firework. But what if they don't pay? After all, if I'm your neighbor, I get to see your firework whether or not I paid for it. Moreover, I know that if the other nine neighbors contribute their $1, you'll still buy the firework. After all, their $9 plus your $5 still exceeds the cost of $10. So I'll still get to see the firework even though I'm not paying. Therefore, I'll get to see the firework and get to keep my dollar. So why would I ever contribute? But if I think this way, 
Why wouldn't everyone else in the neighborhood think this way? Why would anyone want to be the sucker to pay for something you could watch for free? And if everyone thinks this way, then you don't get any money from the neighbors. And we're back in the situation in which you don't buy the firework and society's worse off for it. This is called the free rider problem. If people benefit from goods they don't produce or pay for, they might not contribute enough to get the good produced. As a result, goods that have social marginal benefit higher than social marginal cost don't get produced. Fireworks that will be valued at above their cost don't get set off. This is why the private market can't be counted on to provide public goods. It's why we rely on the government to provide things like national defense, roads, and parks. Of course, the free rider problem can arise with governments as well. Think about this in the context of the global climate change problem we mentioned in an earlier application video. Any effort of one country to reduce their carbon emissions benefits the entire world in terms of long-run climate stability. So each country may think, why should I sacrifice to reduce emissions? I can just let other countries do it and I'm still getting the benefits. So no country contributes and climate change continues to be a problem. A country's government may be able to help solve the free rider problem within its own borders, but on the world stage, country governments are susceptible to their own free rider problems.